Welcome to Brussels Forum 2020. We are pleased to introduce the Vice President for Foreign Policy at the German Marshall Fund, Dr. Ian Lasser. Good afternoon from Brussels and welcome back to Brussels Forum 2020. Uh, we are pleased to have everybody with us this afternoon and we're gonna continue our conversation uh, to talk about anticipating the unknown after COVID-19. And maybe we'll even talk about anticipating some of the unknowns during the COVID-19 crisis, because there's certainly no shortage of those. Um, let me say we're really delighted to have this conversation in, well, the next to last day of Brussels Forum uh, with two longtime friends of Brussels Forum, in fact, uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Joanna, and the US Deputy Secretary of State, Stephen Began. Uh, we're really grateful to both of you for joining us. Uh, Mircea, Steve, if I may, welcome. Thank you for coming with us. Uh, let me say a thanks to our partners, as always, to our founding partners, Daimler and the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and to our forum partner, Deloitte, and to all our associate and supporting uh, and knowledge partners. We're really very, very, very grateful. Um, and let me, on this occasion, also say a special word of thanks uh, to NATO. Uh, to the U.S. mission to NATO, to the U.S. mission to the European Union, uh, to all of them for their support to Brussels Forum, but also to GMF throughout the year. Uh, and let me now turn it over to our moderator, and let me introduce our moderator, uh, Katrina Manson, who is U.S. foreign policy and defense correspondent of the Financial Times based in Washington. Katrina, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks to everyone for joining. And Katrina, over to you. Thank you so much, Ian. Well, it's lovely to be here and with my guests today. Let me introduce them. We have Stephen Began, the Deputy Secretary of State. He joined the Trump administration as the Special Representative for North Korea. Um, after fixing that in a year, he became Deputy Secretary of State. And um, he's also a long time student of Russia. So we're delighted to have him. And he's joined by his old friend. They first met 25 years ago, uh, Mircea Joana, the former Foreign Minister of Romania, a, a presidential aspirant himself at one point. So no stranger to politics, diplomacy, uh, economics or indeed now security. He's Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Um, and they both took up their positions, their latest positions in December. Uh, they met in DC in February and of course have not met since in person because of coronavirus. But I'm delighted to have them both here and I'm delighted to have you here too. Please send in your questions. Um, there are a couple of ways you can do it. The first is via Twitter at hashtag Brussels Forum, and the second is uh, via email at brusselsforum at gmfus.org. So here we are to talk about the transatlantic relationship in the time of COVID, a um, little bit like love in a cold climate. Um, even before COVID, the Trump administration made it clear that um, this was a tricky relationship on the campaign trail. We all know he called it obsolete. Uh, he's chastised NATO members for not making their defense spending commitments. Um, and that's before French President Emmanuel Macron said that NATO was heading for uh, brain death. So even then, the conditions were tricky. And then along comes coronavirus. Uh, America is home to a quarter of the cases, quarter of the deaths, with only uh, a little bit more than 4% of the world population. So having a, a very outsized experience of coronavirus. And this weekend's numbers were, were, were really very bad, record highs, 45,000 new cases on Friday, 42,000 new cases on Saturday. Um, so there's a lot going on, um, even before we consider the foreign policy dimensions. And I just wanted to let you all know um, a little bit of a secret. Um, tomorrow, the German Marshall Fund is releasing uh, the results of its transatlantic trends survey. And I'd like to share just one of the bits of information with you all here now, which is that in a, in a poll of Germans, French and Americans, uh, the impression of China's global influence of the world has actually doubled. Uh, throughout this coronavirus crisis, which is um, perhaps extraordinary to think, especially given coronavirus um, originated in China. So that's a lot to put to Deputy Secretary Began. But if I can start with you, um, tensions in the alliance, um, hemorrhaging global influence to China through this coronavirus, and of course facing a, a very difficult struggle 
in America. How has the US got coronavirus um, so wrong? And if you haven't got coronavirus so wrong, let, let me hear it. Thank you, and over to you first. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. In that, in that, uh, before I start, let me uh, extend my thanks also to Ian Lesser and to my colleague on the panel here, Marcia Joanna. Uh, uh, the German Marshall Fund Brussels Forum is something that I put on the calendar every year uh, for uh, uh, the better part of a uh, decade and a half as I look forward to this each year. But again, as I walked over here with a mask, face mask on and, and to participate in a virtual discussion, uh, I, I was hit by the same thought that I've been uh, plagued with many, many uh, mornings over the course of the last five months, that uh, how did it come to this? How in the world did we get to the point where, um, where a, a global pandemic is, is preventing us from most of the normal features of life? And I know that everybody has felt that in different ways, some very personally, and my, uh, certainly my sympathies to any of you who, who uh, have suffered personal tragedy as a consequence of this pandemic as well. Um, the, uh, I, I have had a, a ringside uh, seat or maybe even in the ring seat on uh, the US battle against uh, COVID-19 from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, uh, after my official swearing in on January 17th, just a week later, we uh, first saw uh, the uh, intelligence reports coming in uh, and press reports really more importantly that suggested this uh, novel virus in, in China was beginning to spread out of control. We'd known about it a bit longer than that, but the magnitude of it uh, combined with a, a wariness on the part of many of our health professionals because of previous experiences with pandemic outbreaks out of China uh, led us to very quickly stand up a, 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 an effort that was initially chaired by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, ultimately starting in late February by the Vice President of the United States uh, the Coronavirus Task Force, which was, uh, which was um, entrusted to steer to a large part the efforts of the country as we navigated our way through the crisis. The, um, uh, the uh, initial stages of this uh, did uh, significantly involve the Department of State, and, and my role uh, was much more active in the beginning of the process because at that point, the goal was to try to contain uh, the virus from reaching into the United States of America. We enacted very aggressive restrictions on travel here into the United States and also a number of advisories warning American citizens uh, against traveling abroad uh, to hotspots. As, as much as we moved and as quickly as we moved, it turns out we were already too late and it, we, were, we were too late in two respects. One is that um, the, uh, in, between the onset of the virus in China and ultimately uh, the uh, closures that were put in place in Hubei province and Wuhan, approximately 5 million Chinese citizens traveled out of Hubei province and, and many of them out of China. And even though we imposed travel restrictions on direct travel from China starting in late January, right at the end of the month, um, it, the virus had already metastasized to many other parts of the world. And in fact, uh, a significant amount of the infections came to the United States uh, indirectly uh, through Europe and, and through travelers that reached Europe first and then came to the United States. Um, all of us were, uh, uh, were struggling to move quickly, but the virus moved faster than virtually any government could. The Chinese did very successfully crack down on internal movements and were able to successfully contain the virus largely to the Hubei province, although they did have a number of outbreaks in other parts of the country, which they turned back. Europe, uh, Europe then quickly moved. A couple of European countries were hard hit, uh, in, in particular Italy and Spain, but France too and so on and so on. We, I, I won't recite the progression. We know how the virus spread around, around the world. Here in the United States of America, as we saw that uh, in late February and early March, the cases began to expand dramatically. We enacted uh, social distancing measures that were successfully implemented in many states ar around the country. There were some states that had, had uh, uh, moved a little bit too late and saw a, a, a tragic uh, expansion of cases. This is particularly the case in the Northeast. Uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, Massachusetts to some extent. A number of metropolitan areas suffered uh, uh, rapid outbreaks, but then ultimately were able to contain them. And by the end of uh, by the end of May and into June, it seemed like the United States had been able to largely overcome the uh, uh, the outbreaks and moved into a, a flattening of the curve. But um, as uh, as is well known and as Katrina referenced, we are facing a number of very serious uh, upticks again. 
And uh, I will just say that uh, 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 somewhat uh, uh, cautiously that uh, I, we expect this to, uh, to continue to be a challenge that we will face here in the United States, but also other countries around the world as well. Um, there are uh, many severe outbreaks around the world as we speak, and, and the risk is constant uh, for, uh, for uh, additional, uh, additional cases and clusters to develop, including in countries which have already uh, been successful in turning down the infection rate substantially. Um, you know, we, um, we, are, uh, we are finding the COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in the effects of a pandemic have in some ways uh, laid bare some of the challenges uh, to, op uh, to operating and living in a democratic society with, with distributed governing power. The United States of America has always prided itself in being a federal, uh, a federation of states, a federalist system in which the states have significant authority, but also uh, it falls upon those states to, to exercise uh, effective governance and the federal government has to work with them. The federal government has to be clear with them. And, and it's been a challenge uh, to, uh, to uh, implement uh, evenly across the entire country, a set of uh, uh, policies that is gonna be able to uh, keep us uh, systematically low on caseload. I am confident that the, uh, that the recent steps taken by the governors are gonna, uh, gonna address this. We'll probably see a bit of a lag but I expect and, and, and certainly hope that we will be seeing a downturn here in the United States in the very near future. Um, the news isn't all uh, bad, although that news is bad. Uh, we are making uh, tremendous progress in the development of therapeutics and vaccines, not just here in the United States, but globally. We have found uh, a, 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 a positive success in rendivisir, a therapeutic treatment, as well as a few others that are under, under study and, and also the United States uh, has about a dozen vaccine candidates that are currently being uh, pursued. A number of them also look promising, so much so that like many other governments around the world, we are already investing in the production of hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines, as well as putting together the means to distribute and administer them as quickly as possible. Of course, we're doing this uh, uh, not by ourselves alone, but with, uh, alongside many other partners around the world uh, in collaborative research. And also we're working very actively through the Gavi uh, uh, Global uh, Vaccine Initiative where the United States is now raises the biggest donor. We've made a major contribution at the donors conference earlier this year held in London. Um, the, uh, uh, just a, a last word, if I could, on, on I think what really is at the center of this though, rather than a, 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 a reflection back on what has transpired over the past five months is what are the consequences for the world? And here, uh, I'd just like to share a couple of thoughts. First, as I said, that um, the, uh, uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, not just in the United States, but in many places around the world has, uh, has laid bare some of the challenges in global governance and, and, and in national governance. It's also amplified some of the challenges that uh, we face in today's world, including political polarization, including uh, division over, uh, over uh, uh, global systems of government, even, uh, even uh, uh, challenges between authoritarianism and democracy. And, and we have to be mindful uh, that, uh, uh, that the facts on the ground will be very much important in how we are able to, to, uh, to really win that debate, which we must do. And, and I think the first, first priority for all of us has to be make our own countries and societies healthy, but our second has to be to work together with each other uh, uh, to achieve that end. Uh, for my part, uh, uh, early on uh, here at the State, uh, State Department, I was uh, given an assignment by the Secretary of State to make sure that we were gluing together the most important parts of the, uh, 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 the international coalition of like-minded countries, our partners and allies around the world. And so we began a regular consultative process, which included my counterpart on the call today, Mirsha Joanna, uh, where we held uh, a weekly conference calls uh, where we addressed a very short agenda of items among the European Quad, the United States, NATO, the European Union, and Canada. This transatlantic group met on a weekly basis for, uh, for uh, several months, regularly comparing notes on any recent developments in each other's countries, any urgent requests for assistance, and then also longer term issues for our, our ministries and our governments to cooperate on. I won't go into those in detail here until uh, Q&A, Katrina, but let me just uh, uh, cite a couple that we worked very closely initially on repatriation of citizens around the world. The United States has brought 100,000 American citizens back as uh, largely through a State Department run airlift process. But likewise, our, our uh, friends and allies uh, in Europe had citizens stranded around the world and together we worked to facilitate their return. We've been coordinating our assistance efforts uh, with uh, more vulnerable countries around the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. 
And we've also uh, successfully uh, aligned ourselves in combating disinformation and other challenges to the, uh, the unity and to the, uh, to the democratic foundations of our government as we work through this process. Future challenges include restarting our economies, reopening our borders, uh, and making sure that we are, uh, we are uh, working collaboratively uh, to distribute life-saving uh, medical, uh, uh, medical uh, uh, supplies and also uh, vaccines and therapeutic, therapeutics. Uh, when they are proven and, and available in scale, so lots to do, uh, lots, uh, uh, lots to do with uh, with our, uh, our friends and allies in Europe. At the same time, that we have a lot of challenges to overcome, uh, including the ones that that you mentioned that uh, continue to require the alliance to 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 work work on a way forward to uh, to maintain that uh, set of shared values across the transatlantic relationship that have guided us for 70 years. Uh, I think I'll uh, leave it there and, and expect a lot more detail we can get into and question and answer. And let me uh, turn it back to you, Katrina. Thank you. Well, um, I appreciate the, the outline of the opening remarks and I'll encourage you both to um, engage in discussion from now and permit that under the auspices of opening remarks, but move on to um, a little bit of debate perhaps. Um, if, if we um, reach out now to Deputy Secretary General um, Joanna, NATO of course is more used to focusing on Russia than on a disease. Um, can you tell us the way in which you've tackled coronavirus and, and give us a sense, a little bit of insight into the kinds of challenges? You've obviously been criticized for not um, acting fast enough. Um, are, are those criticisms um, acceptable to you? And, and what have you found hardest? Um, thank you, Katrina. I mean, uh, that's a super professional journalist, uh, knowing that uh, Steve and myself, we met 25 years ago. That's quite, that's quite an information. Uh, Steve, I remember that uh, my first weekend as a very young Romanian ambassador to Washington, a little bit scared, a little bit confused. And I think uh, you and uh, many friends and our generation, we have been paving the way for, for Europe whole and free, enlarging NATO, enlarging the European Union, bringing 100 million of the European citizens who are left in the cold, um, coming back to our natural family that's always here in my heart and our hearts. Katrina is also uh, knowledgeable of the uh, transatlantic trends. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Ian, also my thanks uh, go, go to you. Uh, Steve Egan was mentioning these uh, weekly conversations we had for, uh, for a few months now. I have to thank him and uh, uh, the U.S. for keeping us together in very difficult moments. I also uh, uh, do believe that what we are doing almost on a daily basis with the other like-minded institutions like the European Union, like the UN, I just had today, a long conversation with the with the leadership of the UN on on lessons learned from from this from this virus. Also, we are very happy that Secretary Esper was able to visit in person uh, a few days ago with uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg, and to reconfirm the U.S. commitment to European security. Now, um, uh, let me, Katrina, ask uh, in reverse your question first. Um, the biggest challenge for, for NATO during this crisis is, is quite simple because that's the heart of our mission, is to make sure that this health crisis and economic downturn does not become a security crisis as well. That's, that's about it. And of course, uh, as Steve has mentioned earlier, uh, this pandemic, which is so you know, much magnifying lots of trends and sub-trends and things we're not aware about, uh, uh, so much. Uh, this is adding up to security challenges that are already here. They have not disappeared. They've been only amplified. Um, this crisis has distorted and amplified pre-existing security challenges. The Russian military and hybrid activities, the nuclear capable missiles arsenal, which is growing. Terrorist groups are still active and they are committing atrocities against innocent people in many places cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns. We have sent something that I believe is a, is a red line. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to against a nation, irrespective of its system of political uh, organization, to promote its own interest and to make a little bit of propaganda um, around things that they do, uh, sending uh, support in one country or another. But when cyber attacks and misinformation 
are hitting the, our health systems. It was the case. We have seen healthcare services having suffered cyber attacks in the midst of a global pandemic. This is dangerous and irresponsible because this is not just a game of influence. This is costing innocent lives. Oh, um, was NATO slow in responding? I would say that initially, uh, nations in the first days of the pandemic and also us as an organization comp comprising 30 allies, of course, the first instinct was to reply, uh, to go towards your own interest, uh, protect your citizens. But I have to say that after a, a short period of time when nations, including uh, in the alliance, try to find answers for their own citizens, which is what politicians are in the end supposed to be doing, then we've seen a remarkable uh, surge of solidarity. We've seen uh, tens of thousands of our military people joining ranks uh, with the uh, military uh, and, and the civilian personnel. We've seen uh, thousands and thousands of shipments of medical equipment with our strategic airlift. We've seen solidarity in action. And this is something that I believe uh, proves that our alliance is strong, is, is vital, and also is learning the lessons of this thing. And this is my last comment to this first part, because I also want, like you do, and Steve wants to, to engage with the, uh, with the audience, thanking GMF again for this wonderful opportunity. We are obliged as democratic nations to come out from this pandemic stronger. There is a risk that the lessons learned at the national level could draw in some corners of the democratic world to some divergent conclusions. I say one thing, and I believe strongly in this, and we believe here in NATO, and I know Steve believes in this, and I think all of us believe in this, that if there is today a challenge for all the democratic nations around the world, is the ascent of less democratic, uh, more totalitarian uh, narratives, that for the first time in half a millennia, the West is for the first time confronted with competitor that also is trying to get supremacy on the technology front. And I think the only lesson we can draw from this, that here in Europe, across the Atlantic, in NATO, but also with all the other global allies of ours, from the Asia Pacific, from India, from many other places that we have to join forces, because this is just the beginning of an acceleration of a global competition when our very values, our way of life are threatened and menaced. This is what NATO is all about, and this is what I believe all democratic nations and leaders and people around the world, uh, freedom lovers from around the world, we have to stick together, learn the lessons, and come out of this thing stronger together. Thank you so much. Well, let me stay with you, Ambassador Joanna, because um, you referenced the rise of other countries that don't share the same view, and, and I would like to press you on, on this information that, we, that the German Marshall Fund has gathered, which says that China's standing in the world, its, its, its perception of its global influence among Germans, French and Americans has actually risen. It's, it's approximately doubled throughout this um, uh, coronavirus pandemic. What's going wrong in your responses, in your coordination with your allies, with the US, that that, that is happening, that that trend is actually going against the way you wish to see it go? Listen, uh, again, um, we all recognize that at the beginning of the pandemic, the reactions were a little bit uh, less coordinated. But after this, we have joined forces, us in NATO with our friends in, um, uh, in the European Union, us in NATO with our friends at the UN. Us in NATO, Steve remembers that we've been talking also to the G7 Strategic Communication Task Force. Because to be honest, it's sometimes more difficult to fight with the power of truth against this information and conspiracy theories. Sometimes crazy news, invented stories, uh, totally outright lies uh, travel faster than the fact-based thing that we usually uh, present. But I still believe one thing, and we are seeing progress being made, that we have only one way forward. Number one, to join forces. Secondly, to get allies in the public opinion and with professional journalists, 
from the free world, from around the world, because alone we cannot communicate. We need you, Katrina, and all, all your, your fellow professional journalists uh, that are doing their profession with integrity and, and, and commitment to, to, to loyalty to their readers. And thirdly, also to, to making sure that once there is a red line crossed, that we also say that very clearly and making sure that there is a, a line where we just cannot accept uh, this information and outright lies to affect lives and our uh, way of, of doing things. And there is one thing that as a Romanian that lived half of my life uh, under in the dark out in communism. I'm, I'm an I'm a absolute believer that in the end, democracy as a form of organizing human mankind is much better than those societies. And I think there is a limit to what this kind of combination of state power and private uh, sector power in the hands of the government and together with intelligence and again with lots of other things will be able to be doing. Because there is one thing I know from my experience. There is something that I know from the tens of, of millions of fellow European citizens from my part of, of European geography, that there is no way in which on the longer term, a close society can be more competitive, provide better social services, provide better ways of raising your kids than open societies. So it's up to us to defend our story all of us, not just a few uh, spokespeople from one organization or the other or professional politicians. I think we are in this together to defend our way of life. And I'm convinced we'll prevail. And Ambassador, can you, and I'll come to Mr. Began in a moment, but could you just explain a little bit about NATO's new focus on China? Obviously, it was only uh, a few months ago that, uh, I think around the time you joined, that China became a, uh, an issue of strategic challenge and also of opportunity for NATO. Um, I've been asked by experts, they're trying to work out if this is um, a real concern, an intrinsic concern for NATO, who obviously has normally looked at Russia as the number one concern, or if you're trying to please America, uh, because we know that the Trump administration's focus is, is um, very hardly, sharply focused on China. Katrina, you're right. In London, the NATO leaders, uh, basically in their final communique, they mentioned for the first time explicitly China both as a challenge and an opportunity. Meanwhile, you also see in the European Union how they developed uh, some form of updated, uh, let's say objective analysis of the implications of the rise of China. This is no small country. This is not something that we can take lightly. And there are some things that are positive about uh, a big country moving up, becoming, let's say, stronger economically, engaging in, in, in global trade, and there are also challenges. Uh, today, China has the second largest defense budget uh, after the US. In the last five years alone, um, China has added to its Navy submarines and, and ships and frigates uh, the whole size of the UK Navy. Um, they are deploying now and, and investing a lot in missile, high-end missile uh, uh, capabilities. They're working in hypersonic and superglide. They are going in space. So we are not going in Asia. NATO is a, is a transatlantic alliance. Uh, Russia uh, remains a major uh, concern for us. Terrorism is a concern. But we just cannot pretend we are blind. This is changing the balance of power. Uh, China is building up its military might. And we have to make sure that um, uh, all these things are done in a way that will protect our interests. We don't, are not seeking for new enemies or adversaries, but to be lucid and to, to look to, to, to the rise of China also with the lenses of prudence is something that we should do. And this is not something to please the Americans or anybody else. This is something that also European allies, UK, in Germany, in France, and also expressed in the last uh, EU-China summit by VTC just the other day. There were things about China's purchasing strategic infrastructure in Europe. China also purchasing crown jewels of our technology companies. We have to find a way to protect also our intellectual property from sometimes actual theft and industrial espionage. These are things that are real. So there is no need to please anybody. It's just a fact of life. It's effective geopolitics, and democratic nations have to stick together 
in finding a common answer against this massive transformation of global affairs. Thank you. Mr. Began, what would you like NATO to do about China? I, you know, um, one of the things that I'm struck by, Katrina, is the degree to which Chinese uh, interest, Chinese influence touches virtually every dimension of the work that we do here at the Department of State. There's not a part of the world, there's not a, not a, a function that we do that isn't somehow, uh, in some way, shape, or form, uh, brushing up against or touching on China-related issues. Now, not all of those are negative. Uh, the United States and China uh, do uh, uh, work with each other in, in, on some issues, uh, Afghanistan, uh, North Korea to some extent, and, and others. But at the same time, uh, it also is, uh, is not a question of, of us extending NATO into Asia or into China, but rather having a shared view of exactly what the challenges are from that Chinese influence. Mercia identified several of them, including acquisition of strategic technologies, potential uh, infiltration into our communications networks. Um, uh, the, uh, one, of the, one of the issues that the United States and Europe uh, have uh, long collaborated on is uh, strong global institutions in order to uh, maintain a rules-based order in the world, one that's served both of our interests um, for more than uh, seven decades. We made a bet uh, 20 years ago that we would bring China into uh, many of those institutions and that our, our thought was the institutions would be resilient enough to slowly, uh, slowly shift Chinese behavior uh, uh, into a support for that rules-based system. But what we found instead was that China grew so quick, uh, quickly and so, uh, so significantly that China actually began to influence those institutions. And, that's a challenge that we confront uh, together with our European friends and allies and many other countries around the world. Um, the, uh, you know, it, the relationship with uh, China is, is not one dimensional. China is not a monolith, just as none of our societies are. So we have to have uh, some nuance in our approach. But uh, for sure, I couldn't agree more with, with uh, Mercia that uh, the foundation of democratic governance, free market uh, societies is is absolutely something that we need to work together to defend and, and, and one that we do every day with our partners in Europe. And why do you think China has emerged more politically influential throughout this coronavirus pandemic? And if I can add another one um, that also reflects a question from a member of the audience, how do you characterize the relationship between China and Russia at the moment? Is it becoming a de facto alliance? Yeah. So um, I, I heard you uh, reference the GMF poll in, a couple of times, and, and I don't have the, uh, the benefit of, of seeing exactly what it is. But in terms of uh, if, it's a, if it's a measure of uh, uh, if it's a reflection of China's assertiveness in the world, hands down, uh, we've seen that. And particularly in the aftermath of, of China's outbreak of COVID-19, if it's a rise in, uh, in the appeal of China's system, that would be a very different, uh, different kettle of fish. And if it's if it's just a, a a measure of China's raw naked power, that that is a slightly a third slightly different nuance. But l l let me say, um, for sure, we've seen what uh, many of your uh, participants in your poll have seen since January. As have the Indians in the Galwan Valley. As have the people of Hong Kong uh, in the uh, in the National People's Congress uh, passage of a new national security law. As have the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, who are uh, currently in concentration camps. The two potentially up to a million, uh, million Chinese citizens of Muslim descent, Muslim, uh, Muslim faith, who are uh, being held in prison, as well as the people of Taiwan who have faced unprecedented pressure after a strong and democratic election that, that brought, uh, brought uh, President Tsai back to power again. Uh, Australia has felt it in the, in the weight of China's uh, economic might in, in, uh, in pushing back against Australia's uh, reasonable uh, request that an inquiry be held through uh, international organizations to check the uh, check the uh, the history and performance and and and, and details reg regarding the outbreak of COVID nineteen and many of your uh, many of your European uh, neighbors uh, uh, Katrina have felt it in the uh, in the disinformation and the in the heavy heavy uh, 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 overtones of wolf uh, diplomacy uh, in Germany and in, in Belgium and in, in in, uh, in the commission itself and elsewhere. Um, these are in some ways measures of power or measures of, of effect and influence in the world. But, but at the same time, uh, they are also simply laying bare what 
what has been happening now for uh, for some time, which is China has made a fundamental shift. And, and I've, I've, I've pondered the question of why, because it, it, without a doubt, it is uh, it, uh, China has been much more assertive and they in, in, in even aggressive. Uh, I, I didn't even mention the South China Sea. I should add that to the list that I just ticked off. I, I think uh, the COVID-19 crisis in in China in December and January uh, may have very well in some quarters been seen as an existential threat uh, to the rule of the Communist Party. I actually think that the brittleness of the system became apparent to many in, in the Chinese government when that unconstrained criticism on Weibo regarding the arrest of the doctor who initially tried to alert colleagues in Wuhan as to the, as to the risks associated with this novel uh, fever virus that was breaking out in their community. I think the Chinese government felt ever so slightly that it was losing control. It very quickly moved to to reimpose its control. In fact, in those uh, in in the months of uh, of, uh, of February and March, I'd say the Chinese government devoted as much effort to getting control of the information on the coronavirus as they did uh, to get control of the coronavirus itself. And they seem to have been successful at this point in both respects. This comes at the same time that we ourselves uh, were uh, in many in the in many in the democratic world in the Western world being hit by the hit by the coronavirus and in relative terms, um, uh, our ability to to assert ourselves uh, in a way that counters much of that has been challenged for sure. I, I, I wouldn't dispute that for a second, but um, we have the resilience of democratic societies. Uh, we have the uh, the innovation of our scientific and medical uh, base to to draw upon. And even with the constraints of free people who are allowed to make decisions, sometimes decisions that put themselves at risk and, and hopefully uh, to the extent possible uh, conforming to uh, a sense of social responsibility, not, uh, not under a threat of arrest or imprisonment as a doctor in China might face, but under a sense of, of civic responsibility to their fellow citizens, I'm confident we'll get through this. This is not, this is not a, uh, an easy moment. Uh, for the democratic world, for the free world, uh, for the transatlantic community. Uh, but it's one that I am, have every confidence that we will be resilient and get through. It's just gonna, it's just gonna take us a while as it does oftentimes with a, a challenge, the magnitude of this COVID-19. Um, while I have you, can I ask you to characterize the relationship between China and Russia? Is it getting closer? Is it a de facto alliance? Yeah, so- What is uh, your response? Uh, you know, I think that, I think that relationship is, is uh, transactional. And I think it it uh, rests largely on the foundation of the two current leaders, both of whom seem intent upon putting themselves into office uh, for life, uh, or at least uh, until they otherwise choose on their own initiative to leave. Now, uh, in, in the Russian system, which, uh, which uh, has at least the trappings of a democratic system, uh, President Putin will uh, go to a referendum in just a couple of days, uh, which many consider to be a, a uh, have a foregone conclusion as to the extension of his rule for what effectively is his natural life. In the case of Xi Jinping, uh, when he uh, when he altered the the standing precedent since 1976 that uh, would have limited uh, the uh, Chinese leader to two uh, essentially two terms uh, in office not by law, but by, uh, by custom, uh, Xi Jinping has clearly made, uh, made uh, a, a bet that he can stay in power for the foreseeable future as well. And I think in both cases, that's what sustains that relationship. There's no, um, there's no single unifying factor between those uh, uh, two systems other than a mutual determination to challenge the United States of America. Even in the case of of uh, uh, other countries and other regions of the world, their their, their views differ. I, I, for example, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Indian government is heavily dependent upon uh, the rapid uh, rapid uh, acquisition of arms from Russia in order to put itself in a better position to defend itself against China. Um, I doubt very much that's a, a shared interest between the two countries. We have to think through how we uh, how we address this. We want to be careful not to mobilize a uh, condominium of China and Russia uh, against our interests on a global basis. But at the same time, uh, those two countries do pose a number of challenges. I, I'd go back to what I said about, uh, about uh, China a moment ago, though. It's not a monolith, nor is Russia. Um, there, are, uh, there are places where we can make inroads, and, and we seek to do so uh, with both. Um, it is a, a constant uh, source of challenge to find the political space to do that. Um, in, in our system, uh, the, uh, 
the tendency is to, to reduce to black and white uh, the, the relationships with many countries around the world. But uh, I'm confident that, uh, that with a little application and effort and, and, some, uh, and, and being a bit more agile, uh, we can find the, the, the uh, weak seams in that re relationship between China and Russia that's currently held together by transactional interests. Thank you. And Ambassador Joanna, um, do you think that NATO's focus on um, China is, is helping to, um, in the words of Mr. Began, mobilize a condominium? Listen, um, let me say also a few words about uh, the threats that uh, Russia's uh, buildup of their uh, of their systems is posing to our to our security. That's that's something which is for real. Uh, uh, they have uh, moved up on uh, uh, on a number of uh, of capabilities that are of concern to us. And just last week, the NATO defense ministers met, and we are looking uh, into into this very seriously. Uh, let me say just one thing, because uh, Steve has mentioned resilience a few times, and then he also mentioned agility. Um, if I'm looking to the work that NATO has been doing for the last five years, since the Warsaw NATO summit, when our leaders uh, instructed us to work on, on baseline requirements for resilience, we've been doing this for seven different fields, including infrastructures, energy security, uh, uh, Problems related to civil military cooperation, uh, you know, uh, situations of major crisis or conflict. And last week, we just upgraded our resilience uh, indicators, if you want. And we are working now actively with the European Union to have even a broader understanding of what resilience means to our societies, exchanging this to supply chains, uh, foreign ownership of, uh, of, of critical infrastructures and industries. Uh, strengthening our cyber defenses, counter disinformation, and, and so on and so forth. So what I'm just trying to say here, that we also have to do a better job in getting stronger ourselves as democratic societies uh, after this pandemic, but also to do a better job in assisting the other side of the coin, resilience on one side, fragility on the other side, and lots of nations around the world around the world, and this is also probably reflected in some polls that you mentioned, Katrina, uh, need to see us, the West, the political West, us in Europe, our friends in North America, democratic nations around the world, in doing a much better job in, 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 in making sure that the more fragile nations see uh, a more coordinated response from, from our side. I also share uh, uh, Steve's view that even if uh, the label for the Russia-China uh, relationship is called a strategic partnership of sorts or enhanced strategic partnership. In many ways, it's a tactical arrangement. It's a tactical arrangement uh, trying to, to, to undermine the, the existing global order. Uh, they are, you know, uh, revanchist in, in essence, but still tactical. So we have to find the right balance in between responding to this threat and also making sure that we don't encourage this trend to go uh, in the wrong direction. Thank you. And you, you mentioned coordination. So, of course, I, I have to talk about uh, one of the big issues of, of the weekend, which was that um, the report in the New York Times that US intelligence had determined um, uh, a, a military intelligence arm of Russia, the GRU, had reached out to Taliban-linked militants to offer a bounty to kill NATO troops in Afghanistan. This was targeted at U.S. Uh, forces, but not only U.S. forces. Um, a very serious uh, uh, set of circumstances, if it's the case, and I understand NATO was briefed about it by the U.S. side um, in the past week, um, it, it, but, but the information had been uh, held by the U.S. For, for much longer than that. Are you concerned about a lack of coordination? Would you have wanted to know that information sooner? And how do you view the actual information um, in the report itself? Listen, we, we don't, uh, and we are not, and I am not uh, commenting on, on intelligence reports per se publicly. This is something that is done by essence in, in more discreet ways. But I have to say one thing, and this is our, our number one priority, is to uh, do everything we can 
to keep our men and women in uniform and everybody working for, for the resolute mission, the NATO operation uh, in right. Afghanistan safe. We are working very closely with our American friends and allies to making sure that we create these conditions for all of us, including for the Afghan security yeah. forces. And uh, next week here in uh, at the headquarters, we'll be having uh, a new conversation uh, on, on Afghanistan. So for us, it's paramount to keep um, our troops safe. And uh, we also encourage countries like Russia to adopt uh, more constructive uh, policies and attitudes, because in the end, uh, a stable Afghanistan is not only the interest of the US or of NATO. This is an interest of resolving for the sake of the broader region. You mentioned the condominium, you mentioned Eurasia. A stable Afghanistan this is something that we try to do. It's good for Russia's interest, it's good for uh, China's interest. I think it's good for, for, for everyone. So. Uh, we are very much keen in keeping our, our people safe and we do the utmost to, to doing uh, that for, for our people. Uh, but in that, uh, and I, I respect you don't want to talk about intelligence issues, but do you trust, you spoke about trust, do you s trust the Americans to give you the information that you need to keep your troops safe? Listen, um, uh, there is such a strong bond of trust uh, not only between the US and us here at NATO, but between all allies. And if there are sometimes, let's say, more complex issues, we always discuss and, and get it through. So I have to say that the, 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 the bondage of trust is there. And I'm absolutely convinced that any episode um, uh, is, is, is easy to be worked out when you have such a climate of influence, of, 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 uh, of trust and, and, and confidence amongst us. There's absolutely no no whimper uh, of mistrust in what we do. Um, in, in the focus on NATO 2030 um, and the desire to become more political, how do you tackle issues today where you see some of your members on different sides acting sometimes unilaterally? Uh, let's take Libya, uh, let's take some of Turkey's actions, some of the things France has said, um, actions in Syria. What is NATO's approach to this? And are you being... Uh, taken in too many directions to cope with this political mission? Listen, first of, first of all, uh, life is complex. So you don't expect 30 nations, democratic nations, to see every single day on every single issue eye to eye. That's, that's you know, a statistic, uh, a difficult proposition to make. So it's not the first time in 71 years since NATO was, was, uh, was invented, thanks God. Uh, after the Second World War, that allies have seen things differently, be it for uh, political or strategic interest uh, or for economic interest. So this is not the first time that, that uh, sometimes on, on, on specific topics, there is not perfect harmony in the family. But what uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, basically uh, launched also with GMF just a few days ago, and his vision on NATO 2030 is basically uh, referring to three things. Number one, which is paramount, is vital, is decisive, to keep the alliance strong militarily as we are today, as we have been in the past, as we should remain in the future. Secondly, where the SecGen, as we call him in, 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 in abbreviated uh, uh, friendly uh, appellations, is also calling for uh, let's say, a more robust political NATO. Because NATO is not just a defense organization. We are also a political body. We are an alliance of democracies. And when sometimes things are becoming complex, or we need to anticipate uh, the future, or we have to deal with the current crisis, we have to become stronger uh, politically. And thirdly, something that he said, and I also believe just, just to, 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 to finish on this thing, he also is making the point, and he's right, for NATO to, to become even more global, not only geographically, because we are, in a way, constrained by our uh, Washington Treaty. We are Euro-Atlantic, a transatlantic organization, but to become even more global. And when you become more global, also some of the issues that might appear on NATO's table are not deriving only uh, because, uh, let's say, our immediate geography, also because 
the global situation is becoming more complex. So we had some issues in the past. We have even today some conversations. We always find a way to move forward uh, as a united body. So, so let's t take you at that offer to take a more robust political position. Um, France's Macron said to Turkey, it's playing a dangerous game in Libya. Is that the case or is it France that's playing the dangerous game? Listen, um, we have two allies that have uh, basically raised uh, this issue. France raised this also publicly and also politically in NATO. Turkey has responded. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg instructed our military commanders, our, our specialized bodies, um, uh, to look into this thing. They are preparing a report, and I'm absolutely convinced that uh, uh, the whole reality of that incident uh, will, be, will be very clear to everybody, and also that we create the political conditions for such incidents not to occur uh, in the future. That's the essence of the uh, conversation amongst allies. Not always easy, I have to say, it's not always easy. Um, but there is always a way, uh, because in the end, things that we share are far more important than things that tactically or uh, punctually uh, can make allies uh, differ on a solution for one situation or another. Mr. Began, would you like to, to weigh in that on, on Libya and, and uh, what your allies are up to? Yeah, so uh, uh, Libya certainly uh, uh, gives us a look at the kind of challenges that we're going to be facing uh, in the foreseeable future. And uh, it's a very important uh, test for, uh, for Europe, for the alliance, and, and also uh, for the United States. I have to say, Katrina, that uh, most days I feel like I need a scorecard uh, to keep track of who's on what side in the Libya conflict. Um, I do want to commend the German government uh, for playing also a very important role in Europe. Uh, in the Berlin process to try to bring uh, an end to the fighting. Uh, the United States stands uh, 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 side by side with Chancellor Merkel, and I, I want to commend German leadership on an issue. So you highlight the divisions, but you How also- How many times has the Trump administration commended German leadership on an issue before? Um, so you, when you highlight the divisions, I, I think it is important also to highlight uh, where we're able to work together, and, 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 and this is a good example. Um, but there are others, uh, and uh, and as Mercia says, we just have to work through each of these problems. So we are, uh, we will. Uh, that's uh, that's a hallmark of the alliance. Thank you. And I, while I have you, of course, I've got to ask about North Korea, um, uh, uh, an issue very close to, to your heart, and um, by extension, uh, very very related to what NATO might be trying to look at with arms control and China. Um, your boss, Secretary Pompeo, had said in 2018 that there would be very substantial. Um, nuclear disarmament by the end of President Trump's first term. Is, is that any way going to happen? <laughs> and um, what, what has North Korea been doing since Singapore in terms of developing its own weapons? Yeah, so um, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the getting a deal in North Korea is gonna depend upon the North Koreans, not just us. Uh, we've laid out a, a, a quite a robust and detailed plan uh, that if the North Koreans would engage with us in negotiation, we could make progress very quickly. Um, our goal is uh, and remains the uh, final and, and, and complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is a, uh, is a substantial, uh, uh, certainly has a substantial uh, supply of nuclear material, uh, bombs grade material, um, like, uh, likely uh, according to many uh, public estimates, a, a, a number of weapons as well. And our challenge uh, throughout this process has been North Korea's unwillingness to, to cease those activities in order to allow a diplomatic process to move forward. We do believe there is a, a much brighter future available uh, on the Korean Peninsula for all the people of the Korean Peninsula. It also would be very important to Russia, China, Japan, and a number of other countries around the world. But ultimately, it hinges upon whether or not the North Korean government is prepared to sit down and discuss uh, substantive steps that will get us there. Um, so far, uh, as the uh, lead negotiator, I'll tell you that I, I, I have felt repeatedly that that uh, negotiators have put, uh, put across from us that simply don't have the authority to make those decisions on behalf of their government. And that's a fundamental challenge. In fact, in the run-up to the Hanoi summit, uh, the North Korean negotiators were largely prohibited from discussing matters related to the nuclear weapons at all. They saved that all for the summit meeting itself between the two leaders. And the result uh, that came from that summit was somewhat predictable on that basis. Um, we've had subsequent meetings uh, hosted, uh, uh, one uh, hosted late last year in Europe, where again, um, 
the discussion uh, was largely us describing uh, a, uh, a substantial plan to move forward uh, on all the issues of concern to both us and the North Koreans, but we haven't been able to get them to engage at a political level. We uh, were puzzled as to why, because the hardship in North Korea is palpable. In fact, uh, uh, very likely by uh, by open uh, estimates that the North Korean economy is going to take an even more substantial uh, step backwards than it has in previous years. Uh, so the pressures are immense on the regime and the, and the regime continues to prioritize uh, the expenditure of its resources on its military capabilities. So that also uh, is gonna require us to maintain a, a full deterrent, which we will and we do. I don't think anybody doubts that. Uh, and. Uh, and, and continue to leave the door open to diplomacy. We believe there is still time for the United States and North Korea to make substantial progress in the direction that we believe that both uh, both sides want to go. Certainly that's- and Can I just check you just quickly? Sorry, your, your answers are very helpful. Um, I, we're just running out of time. Does that mean um, you would foresee another summit between the two leaders? In the uh, time remaining and with the uh, wet blanket that COVID-19 has put over the entire world, it's hard to envision uh, the circumstances where we could do uh, in-person international summit, but certainly engagement between the two sides and uh, and we're prepared to do so. Uh, at between the, the North two leaders? Side. Between the two leaders even, engagement? I, I think that I think it's probably uh, unlikely between now and uh, and the uh, U.S. election, uh, it is, uh, as we see events being canceled around the world, including uh, programs like the GMF. In fact, the U.N. General Assembly has announced it's canceling the September session. We're struggling, hope to, hoping to have an in-person meeting of the G7 uh, later this year, but um, circumstances are quite challenging to hold those kind of meetings in person uh, anywhere in the world. Um, I'm going to end by just asking you both a very rapid fire question because we've, we've come to our time. Um, on, on, a, on the nature of Zoom diplomacy, have you found any benefits to jumping from meeting to meeting, looking at people uh, in the face instead of in person, or has it been um, a, a, a real nightmare for you both? Perhaps if I start with you, Deputy Secretary Began. Yeah, so I, I can't say that I, I, uh, I love the format, uh, but I will say this, that I have had more interaction with my counterparts in, in Europe and in, the, in uh, North America via this technology than I would have in a, in a normal course. If you look back the last six months and we didn't have these circumstances, I may have seen counterparts like the uh, uh, German state secretary or the parliamentary secretary of the UK maybe once or twice in a, in a phone call or two in between. I've spoken or met with them uh, virtually on a weekly basis uh, for months now. Uh, I, many of them I've never met in person but I feel like we are on a very close basis and first name relationship even uh, with, that, uh, with each other uh, because of this technology. It's not a perfect substitute, but it, uh, it has allowed us to develop a workaround that in some ways has, has led to more familiarity than we might otherwise have. Thank you so much. And let's give the last word to NATO, more familiarity than you might otherwise have had. Would you, would, would you countenance that with, uh, with COVID? You know, this is lessons learned. Uh, we learned that we can do things in a different way. We have conducted successfully two defense ministerials, one foreign ministers. Um, as I mentioned, we, we invite also friends from around the world. But I think we should not jump into the conclusion that from now on, uh, we can deal with global affairs just by uh, Zoom diplomacy. I think a combination, a smart combination, uh, um, uh, an interesting mix, a hybrid, uh, between traditional diplomacy, because sometimes meeting people, uh, you know, drinking a coffee, uh, exchanging some views in a personal way is important. But I think we have learned that we can do much, much more in a more efficient way using new technology. So uh, NATO is a very agile uh, organization. So we are learning fast. And I think we'll find a new normal uh, quite attractive to all of us. Well, thank you so much, Deputy Secretary General, Deputy Secretary. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and thank you for all your insights and uh, thank you to the audience and it's farewell from me. Thank you. All right.